So let me say welcome to everybody. And the last thing I want to do is ask everybody to be quiet because I love to hear the conversations going on. But I am going to ask you to be quiet. <laughs> Um, and our hesitation is because we're bringing in more chairs, which is always a great thing to have to do, right? Because we're going to talk tonight about creating space, so we're making a little bit more space here. So let me welcome you to this evening's presentation. My name is Sister Kathy Nerney. I'm a professor in our Religious Studies Department, but I direct our Institute for Forgiveness and Reconciliation. And it's our institute that's hosting our guest speaker this evening. And we are so delighted to have her here. And she will soon be introduced to you. But as you know, it's both the mission of Chestnut Hill College and it's the mission of the Institute for Forgiveness and Reconciliation to create space where everyone belongs, no exceptions. And so this inclusive community is what we need to challenge one another as well as work together so that we can create not just a, I don't know, a room, not even just a college campus, but a city and a country where everyone belongs and where diversity and equity and inclusion is the way we live. We have work to do, don't we? And so I'd like to first introduce two of our colleagues from Chestnut Hill College who work with our diversity, equity, and inclusion, and they will introduce us to our guest speaker tonight. So um, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Kim and Chansey. Here we go. Good evening, how is everyone? Okay. So from the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, my name is Kim Irvine. I'm full-time business faculty and interim director of DEI. Chancey Page is an assistant director of Campus Life for Residence Life and interim assistant director of DEI. We are also both members of the Institute for Forgiveness and Reconciliation Planning Team. As a team from the Office of DEI, Chansey and I are honored to be part of Chestnut Hill College event to highlight that DEI is owned by all of us. That includes student, faculty, staff, administration, and our community. Tonight, we are going to come together to listen to a presentation and have follow-up conversations about the importance of welcoming all to society. Within today's discussion, we will discuss what allies can do to make space for hard truths and difficult conversations. It is with great honor that the Office of DEI partners with the Institute for Forgiveness and Reconciliation to welcome Dr. Debonair, Debonair excuse me, Oates Primus. As an advisor of the Black Student Union here at Chestnut Hill, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, as well as others from historically underrepresented groups, spend so much of their time minimizing their difference and erasing parts of their cultural identity. Tonight, Truth Telling Masterclass will resonate with some of you and others we ask to be committed allies that offer a space of support and love. It is with great privilege that I introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Debonair, Debonair, excuse me, Oates Primus, who grew up here in West Philadelphia and is now a distinguished race scholar and award-winning diversity, equity, and inclusion strategist. Dr. Oates Primus earned a Bachelor of Arts in English from Westchester University a Master's of Arts in English from St. Joseph's University, and a doctorate degree in philosophy with a concentration in English. She is the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Oak View Group. Dr. Oates Primus, excuse me, Primus, will present the Truth-Telling Masterclass using unapologetic authenticity and reconfiguring non-inclusive spaces to address racial traumas. Please welcome Dr. Oates Primus.
Good evening. That was a mouthful. That was so, I don't know. I haven't been in academia for almost a year now and corporate is different. So I, like, I love being back because you guys love like wordiness and in corporate, it's like, give it to us faster, you know? Um, anyway, good evening. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited with a full house, so that's exciting. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I should have asked for some water. Thank you so much. I'm getting over, I'm not sick, but I had like a nasal drip. Um, so let's get started, because I have a, uh, let me get my phone out so I can time myself. Because if I don't, I'm, I've, been, I've been a teacher for 15 years and I don't know how to be brief, so I'm putting a timer. I'm sorry, so I can, yep, that's happening. Okay, I'm ready. Oh, so, all right, I'm gonna start with like, like my first quote. I love quotes. I taught English for 15 years, so I love words. If you wanna live a full life, you have to tell the truth. Anything that is held together by you playing small or silencing your voice is only secure when you are not you. This is a quote I found on social media by a therapist, <clears throat> a black therapist, Terry McMillan. Thank you. And on my bad days, I have it on a um, affirmation card and I look at it over and over again to remind myself that it is my job to tell the truth. And you might think, doesn't everyone tell the truth? What do I mean? Let me tell you something about, about like my background so you understand why, why it's so hard for someone like me to tell the truth about myself. I am a first generation college student. I grew up in West Philadelphia in a low income family, a low income community. My mother was a teenage mom. She had me really young and um, she raised me and my younger sister by herself. And I grew up in a violent neighborhood, but also, I know you don't think these two things go together, but a really loving neighborhood as well, Philly. I mean, you know, just, I don't know how many Philly natives you have, but that's just, you know, that's, that's, that's what our reality is. And um, I, my mom worked three jobs so I can go to a private school from K through 12 because, you know, the education gap is real. And in my neighborhood, access to quality education just was not um, a realistic ambition. And then I went to a magnet high school in Philadelphia, and then I went to a PWI, which is a you know, predominantly white institution. And it was at that predominantly white institution that I realized how different I was and how telling my truth was dangerous. And when I say dangerous, I mean dangerous to my future. I learned really quickly that telling my truths about where I'm from and who I am could cost me a lot. Recommendations for graduate school, recommendations for opportunities. I learned that in order for me to get ahead, it was super important for me to mask and erase parts of my identity. And I did that really well. I learned it quickly. I built relationships with, with professors in undergrad and I played the game and I got into graduate school. I got in every graduate school I applied to. And then I went to a, my, my PhD program and then I got into my professional um, career and I was good at it. I did the same thing in my professional career. I erased, I minimized, I did my light so that I could move up within this structure. I learned really easily that I was more palatable being, being, um, like being small, right? Smaller than who I am. I come from West Philly, from a loud family. I'm a loud person by nature. I use my hands, I cold switch regularly. And I learned that like some of those behaviors were seen by my colleagues as unsophisticated and that turned into like you don't, we don't know if we're gonna tap you for this opportunity or not. You aren't the person we're looking for. So, you know, I did that and I thought that was just the game. The game was I came into work, someone else, and I left out, you know what I mean, myself. And I was fine with that. Until I started working with students. I taught English at Community College of Philadelphia. I taught English at almost every university in this city when I was an adjunct, except for Chestnut Hill, surprisingly. <laughs> but St. Joe's, Newman, Temple, I worked at all those places, but when I worked at CCP, it was the first time in my career where I taught predominantly students who looked like me. It was the first time I walked in the classrooms and I was like, hold up, this is like a family reunion in here, right? <laughs> it was like, what? It was almost, you know, I was like, what is going on in a good way? And they were looking at me and I was modeling what it, 
what it meant to be a successful black woman. And I had a responsibility, and at first I didn't take it seriously. I was still shrinking myself to fit into this academic space. And I had a student, his name was Max, and he took like three classes with me. He was a black male student, and we were walking in the hallway, and he said, I think I wanna do what you do. I was like, really? You don't get that often, I teach English. No one wants to teach English, you know what I mean? I'm not joking, I'm like, I wanna do this. But he didn't mean English, he said he wanted to teach on a college level. And he was like, you know what, I want you to write me a recommendation for Temple. And I was like, sure. And he was like, you know, I felt like, and he was, by the way, he was brilliant. I should have said this, brilliant, brilliant student. And, um, and then he said to me, I, you know, I feel like I have the academic chops, but I gotta work on, you know, that thing you got going. And I was scared to ask him, but I was like, what, you, what do you mean? He's like, you know, like you're so polished and professional. And he meant it as a compliment, but it hit me like a bag of rocks. I was like, really? And he was like, you just, you know, you're so poised. He was like, you know, you just, you, like, you really have that thing down and you can tell, you know, you're gonna go far. And he left me and I just was thinking like, that's the impression I'm leaving on him. That in order to go far, you have to be polished. You have to erase your cultural identity. And he was like, I'm a, you know, I'm a work on that so I can do this. And I wanted to scream to him, like, don't work on it. Don't do this. Like, this is not what I'm trying to show you. But instead, I didn't. And I took, a, like, a long look in the mirror. And I was like, this is not who I want my students to be. I don't want them to think that in order to get ahead, you have to erase every part of you. I also wasn't being authentic. They were not getting to know me in the classroom. Because I felt like all the parts of me, the parts that love Drake, and Meek Mills, and listens to that on my way into work, and this is true, <clears throat> this is all true. All those parts of me that's grading papers in my office with my AirPods in, with my Drake playlist, or my Beyonce playlist, or whatever the case. You know what I mean, like that was me, that's also part of me, and I wasn't showing them that. And I thought to myself, like, okay. And I did it slowly. I said, what can I do so that I'm not doing this? I'm not silencing myself. And I started with my syllabus, I was like, I'm teaching English 101 and I got all my degrees in African American literature, but yet you don't see that in my syllabus. Not prominently. It was in a section, right? We did a segment on that. But I was like, mm-mm, we're doing all of it. Every writer you're gonna read in this class is gonna be from a per, you know, from like an underrepresented group. And it was a risk. I got pushback from my department chair, from everything. I'm like, I don't care. This is what we're doing, right? I started off there. And then I started sharing some of my story in class, little by little. Like the first time I saw, I was a first generation college student in class, the way my black and brown students reacted was just like, really? And I was like, yeah, I grew up in West Philly. Again, pause for reaction, like, no. I was like, yep. Right, and just, the more I did that, the more they would come to me after class. I sort of realized, like, after class in my office, they would be like, oh my God, Dr. Deb, like, you know, I would love for you to mentor me on this. The more authentic I showed up, the more authentic they showed up in class and I was loving it, right? The more unapologetic they became in my class. And I'm like, hold up. We got like a whole thing going on here. I'm showing up more authentically and you are in the class as well. You're sharing more. And I realized that this was really important. It was really important for me to be like, this is not, I'm not, I, I'm gonna stop shrinking. I'm gonna stop making myself small because y'all don't need to make yourself small. Because academia is a space that should be durable enough to expand for people like us. And we learn for so much of our lives as people of color that we're supposed to fit into the space. But what if we did it the other way around? What if the space has to make room for us? And what does that look like? What does it look like for like, the space to you know, open up for me? So I start doing little things. When I cleaned up my office at the end of the, uh, of, like, the semester, I didn't put headphones in anymore. I just brought like my little portable speaker and let the music play. Yeah, exactly. It's fine. Drake not gonna hurt nobody, <laughs> right? And I, right, I did it unapologetically. Kept the door open, cleaned up my office, let my colleagues, you know, I dared them to say something. I didn't, but I just was like, come in here and bring it. Bring this whole. Go ahead and police me in this in this space and see how it goes. Your chair of Black Studies. We gonna have fun. We are going to have fun historicizing and analyzing what you're doing to me in this space, but it never happened. I took a deep breath like, oh look, I played music in this space without my headphones on and everybody lived, and so did I. 
and then little by little, I start going to meetings doing it, cold switching more, right? Just like, good morning, y'all, right? Like in a room full of people who didn't look like me and just letting it sit and letting them get used to me. <laughs> no, I love it. Like, right, just, and you're saying that big yes because as people of color we know, we just are not socialized to do that. Like, what if we did it the other way around? Like, instead of me adjusting to you, what if you got used to me for a little bit? It's okay, right? Like, what if I showed up in this space in all of my blackness, all of my black girlness, and just was unapologetic about it and let it sit for a minute and see how it works? I can do what you like, you know, moving a little bit in your seat. I get it. Make some space for this girl, though. Make some space for her. Don't just move around in your seat. Move over. Move over because I'm here. I might take a, you know what I mean? Like, I'm here and I'm not going anywhere and I'm educated, I'm smart, I'm gonna change this entire institution if you let me, and I did, you're gonna hear about it in a minute, right? By coming into this space and, like, and just being authentically me, and then letting students be authentically them in the classroom, and then telling my students, like, if you're in a class with a professor who is not letting you be you, come to me, talk to me about it, and I'm gonna challenge them, like, what's happening here? Because last time I checked, y'all pay to be here, <laughs> right? So. Just, that's where I want to start, right? This whole idea of shrinking and all the ways that people from underrepresented groups learn that their cultural identity needs to be erased in order to be accepted and palatable. I'm gonna tell some stories though. It's not about me. Oops. All right, but first some questions. I'm a teacher at heart, so I love to engage the audience. Some easy questions. First one, just raise your hand if this fits you, okay? Not yet. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm though. How many people have ever been in a room where they were the only one in the room who looked like them? Hands high. Cool, but you, you can put them down. How many people are the first person in their immediate family to graduate college? Oh, some first gens in here. Thank you. How many of you have ever been the only person of your race or ethnicity in a classroom or place of work? How many of you were ever discouraged from any personal goal or dream because of your race or socioeconomic class? You can't see this because I made edits and this is not the edited version because something happened with this, but whatever. What, like, what this says is the people who had their hands raised the most for those questions are also the people who are the least likely to be psychologically safe in spaces they occupy. So the more times you raise your hand for those series, you probably also are not psychologically safe in most of the spaces you occupy. Who knows what psychological safety is? And it can't be a faculty member. You ever heard that term before, psychological safety? What that means? In DEI spaces is really important. The, the I in DEI stands for inclusion. And most of the work I do when it comes to inclusion is about how do I make spaces psychologically safe for people from underrepresented groups. I literally get paid to do this, right? Um, and I love doing it, and the I is my favorite part of DEI because it's the, it's the space where I get to be like, you know, what do folks from underrepresented groups need, right? And how can I give it to them? Like directly give it to them. This is not abstract, it's not gonna trickle down to them. It's like directly for them. So back to my original question. Psychological safety, what do you think it means? I'll give you a hint. You probably know what it means, you just didn't know that psychological safety is what it was talking about. Safe spaces, that term, it's about psychological safety. It's about physical harm. That is an issue when it comes to folks from underrepresented groups, but safe space is about how do we create psychological safety for people from underrepresented groups. So, that was a hint. I'm sure you know what safe spaces mean. Let's use context clues, my English hat back on, to figure out what does psychological safety mean. Psychological safety is this idea that the space itself allows you to challenge, question, right? A person who's in authority or in a, a place of power. So classrooms are spaces where students are not in a position of power, but the faculty member is. So I want you to think about all the spaces you occupy. Are you psychologically safe in your classroom? You don't have to answer out loud. But by psychologically safe, I mean, do you feel comfortable questioning the person who's in authority without direct consequence? 
Do you feel comfortable challenging them in that space? Do you feel comfortable speaking your mind in that space? And I mean any part. I don't mean just the times where you're in class and you love the lecture or love the reading. I mean, do you feel comfortable in times where a classmate, for example, microaggresses you or makes a statement makes you uncomfortable? Do you feel comfortable or safe in that classroom addressing that behavior? And do you feel like you'll be supported by the person who's in power if you challenge them? That's what psychological safety is. If all those factors come together, your classrooms are psychologically safe spaces. If you thought about that and was like, I don't know, I don't know if my teacher would support me if I, if I challenged them, that's not a psychologically safe space for you. That's not a safe space for you, right? And the reality is, the more times you raise your hand for those earlier questions, the less likely you are to be in psychologically safe spaces in this institution, and then as you go on through and move through the world, you won't. The first time I admitted to my colleagues that the space that I was working was not safe for me, I almost got mouth drops. Like, what do you mean that we make it really safe for you? No, you don't. You're not making it safe for me here. We're not, we are not intentionally trying to hire more people who look like me, first off. That would make it safer for me if there are more people who look like me in this space. That's, that's one way we can start. Another way is for when I check folks or challenge them when they make microaggressive statements in our faculty meetings, I'm not the only one making them. And I'm not the one seen as, as like the troublemaker or the aggressive one. That's not safe for me. Even though when you think about it, all I'm doing in those spaces is trying to protect myself from harm, right? And why is harm coming to me in a space that's supposed to be safe? Right? So we gotta make spaces safe. And I'm so privileged and lucky that I get to work in a position where that's my whole job, to figure out how we make spaces safe for folks from underrepresented groups. But before I was this person, I was on the other end. And I'm gonna tell you a story, because it's my favorite story, one of my favorite students ever, who checked me. Because I also learned that I was not making my space in my classroom as safe for every student as I could. I'm going to tell you Dante's story real quick. So I had a student in my class. I taught at 8 a.m. Oof, an 8 a.m. <laughs> linked English course on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You know the struggle if you know what I'm saying. Students think that, like, they, they think that they're the only ones that hate 8 a.m. But I have, story, I, have, I have news for you. You aren't the only ones that hate 8 a.m. As a faculty member, I was not choosing 8 a.m. either. I just couldn't come in like you. I couldn't come in like, oh, I hate this, you know? I had to pretend, again, with the whole, you know, and coffee helped. But I taught an 8 a.m. linked English and reading course, and, um, you know, it was a full class because a lot of students at CCP work. So 8 a.m.s are really attractive to them because they have jobs. So, you know, they can go to their jobs afterwards. Anyway, I had this student, Dante, and he was quiet. He sat in the back, but he was super attentive. Right? Always did his work, always read everything, but never talked that much during class. Throughout the, throughout the semester, he, be, like he began to start to open up to me outside of class. And I found out that part of it was because he was dealing with a really um, acute form of imposter syndrome. I want to explain what that is later. But, so he would come to me after class in my office, and every time I gave a paper assignment, he would come to my class and ask me to look at a draft, but he was so amazing. He like started his papers like the day after I gave it out, which never happened. He was like, you gave this out and here's the full draft. And I'm like, what is happening here? You're amazing, like you just, anyway, we got to know each other in my office and I found out pretty early on that part of why Dante was, had imposter was because he had recently been incarcerated and was released. And um, he was just getting his life back together. So he would be in my office and he would just be like, oh, this is so new to me. I, I just got out a few months ago. And, you know, I listened and, you know, he didn't need my help that much. He was an A student easy, but he felt like he needed just me to look over things all the time. Anyway, mid-semester comes by and, it's crazy enough, I had a whole segment in my class on mass incarceration. Like a whole segment, they had to write a whole paper on it. His paper was brilliant to this day. I'm like, publish that thing, it was amazing. Anyway, he comes, into my I comes up to me after class one day and he's like, and he won't look at me. He's like looking down. I'm like, what's wrong? What's going on? And he won't look at me while he's talking. And he's like, I have to ask you for a favor, but I don't want to ask you. I'm like, all right, well, how does going to work? How am I, how I going to do it if you don't ask me? And I'm trying to be light and joke with him like we normally do, but he's not laughing today. And he's like, I got, you know, I went out a few days ago with some friends 
in Philly and um, I got in some trouble and I got arrested and I'm on parole. So I have to go into court and convince a judge that I shouldn't go back into prison for this one incident. And I'm, in my head I'm thinking, what do I have to do with this, right? <coughs> and he says, and my lawyer tells me that it will look better if I can have some positive character um, recommendations from people who know me. And I'm like, I'm like, okay. Again, he never looks up at me. And he's like, I hate that I even have to ask you this. I, I know you're disappointed in me, but I just, I need, I need this. And he was taking five classes at CCP. And I looked at him, I said, when do you need it by? And he, looked, and like, he looked up for the first time and he was like, did you hear what I said? I said, I did. When do you need it by? When is this, you know, court appearance? He said it was in two days. And I said, okay, I'll write it tonight. And he looked up at me, he said, like, did you hear what I said? I said, I did. I did, I did. And I'm gonna write it tonight and, you know, um, I'll have it by the next class day. The next class day comes by, after class he comes back up to me and he says, did you, oh, I should, let me, let me rewind. Before I wrote it, I said, is this just, am I just like saying, you know, what kind of student you are? And he was like, yup, nothing much. Just say that I attended class regularly and, you know, I was on time for class and that should do it. A few sentences. He said, just about like who I am as a student. So I wrote a page because Dante was one of the most brilliant students I've ever had. And he wasn't just on time and attended regularly. He was an amazing writer. The kind of analysis that he gave to the kind of readings that we did, just, so I wrote a glowing recommendation as if I was writing it for someone who was going, applying for grad school, right? And um, he, I hand it to him and he sees there's a whole page. He's like, what is this? I said, can you read it for me real quick? Like right in front of me, I printed it out. I said, can you read it for me just really quickly and make sure it's okay? He reads through it and you know, Dante is, is tough, you know what I'm saying? Like he, he's a tough dude. He is like, just like, I mean, you know what I mean? He is like, you know, you can tell. Anyway, he looks up at me and his eyes are glistening. And I was like, you good? He was like, yeah, this is, you didn't have to do all of this, thank you. And I was like, I didn't do anything. This is my job, right? I'm your teacher. You know how many recommendations I write in a year for students for study abroad opportunities, for internships? I'm like, this was fine, and this was the truth. I told, I told the truth about you in this letter. Thank you, and you know, let me know how it goes. I'm like, everything in there is the truth. You are brilliant, you are amazing, you are one of the best students I've ever had. So I really hope you, know, you stay. Friday comes along, and he comes in, and when he comes to me after class, I was like, I guess it went well, since you're here, you know, and not in prison. And, you know, we had a very, I'm very sarcastic, he got it. He was, I was like, I mean, I'm happy that you made it. And he was like, everything worked out, thank you so much. You know, don't worry, this won't happen again. He said, like, this won't ever happen again, I'm serious. I cleaned up my act, it's fine. And I said, Dante, you know you don't owe me any, ex any explanations. And he was like, you never asked me what I did. And I was like, because it doesn't matter. You are more than the sum of your mistakes, and I'm your teacher, and it is my job to talk about your academic performance in my class, not to take what happened in your past to judge you and to continue to bring it up. I never brought it up again for the rest of the semester. He took me two other times after that. We never discussed it again, right? Because he gets to have a reset. He gets to not be like Dante, who you know went to prison for whatever he did. He gets to have a whole fresh start but what he did tell me that disappointed me and what he taught me was, I said, can I, can I ask you why you asked me? You have five other professors in here, right? And I knew he was doing well in every single one of like, his other classes. And he said, you are the only person that I, I, I felt like the least embarrassed by telling this story to. And he said, I'm really, he said, I, I didn't want them to think differently of me. I didn't want to tell them. I would, in order to ask this, I would have had to tell them that I've been to prison before. And he was like, I, you know, I'm trying to have a fresh start here. I don't need, you know what I mean, anything impacting my opportunities. And I got so mad. I got so mad that Dante has to do all of that shrinking in order for him to succeed in a place where he belongs. He belongs in this academic space. He was killing it. And he was like, I don't want anything to mess this up. And it made me think about, who do I work with? Who do I work alongside? Because he wasn't wrong. I wanted to be able to say, you could have told the other faculty members, but no, we couldn't have. You know how I know? I gave this same story at my Limbeck lecture. I won an Limbeck award right before I left my, 
my last job. That's a, that I, that's a teach no more. And I told that story, and so many of my colleagues emailed me and said, thanks for sharing that story, Deb. You're right, I wouldn't have responded the way that you did if Dante would have told me that. And I just was like, this is craziness, right? But what Dante showed me was, it was so important for me to, like, to, to make space for him in that class. And what it made me think about too was like how many times I let students in the mass incarceration section during our discussions talk negatively about people who have been incarcerated in front of Dante and what that must have felt like and how I was a part of not making that space safe for him in those times. Because they didn't know but I knew. And I didn't know how to like navigate that space to be like without, without singling him out. So I'm like, I don't want to single you out so I don't address it in class. And then Dante had to listen to so many of our students who were young, because he was, he was, Dante was older, but at 8 a.m., a lot of younger students took that, that class. So he was in a class of students that were really young, had very little life experience, and just typecasting people who had been incarcerated. So like, like, like the Mason incarceration section, they're just like saying, some of them are saying things like, well, if you do bad things, you, you deserve to be there. And, I, and all I kept thinking about was, what is Dante feeling in this moment? Is this space safe for him? And who are these students to like, to talk about his experience as if they know it? And what's my responsibility in making that space safe for him and did I fail him in that moment? And I did. Dante taught me that I have to be a positive disruption in this class, even if it means that you see me as confrontational. In DI, we learn this a lot. Because we learn, sometimes POC people learn that when you are always challenging the status quo, when you're always checking folks for microaggressions and things of that sort, that we're the aggressor, we're the troublemaker. However, I'm gonna teach you something real quick for DEI. It's something called positive confrontation. And, I, and I sh I'm about to teach you. Because so much of DEI is about reframing, right? In order for me to do this job well, I have to initiate confrontation a lot. It's, it comes with the job, right? I don't get any more to not challenge microaggressive, harmful di dialogues. So it also means that I have to do a lot of self-development work to make sure that I'm taking care of myself so that I'm not internalizing other people's deflections of me. I get a lot of, Deb, you're aggressive. Deb, you're this, and I have to reframe myself like, that's not what's happening right now. You are engaging in harmful dialogue that's making it unsafe for people from underrepresented groups, and I have to positively confront you right now in order to change that. And that's what we have to learn if you're a teacher in this room. It's not me being confrontational in a negative way. But I'm making this space safe for every other person in this class who is from an underrepresented group. And that's more important than these people's comfort. A book I love is called The Discomfort Zone. And it's written by this executive coach, this like star, like executive coach likes like all the big CEOs of this company. And she says that the, the, the discomfort zone is something we have to normalize. Because what comes after discomfort is breakthrough. So if you thought about it that way, you might be uncomfortable in this time where I'm challenging you and calling you racially biased, racially offensive, or whatever the case, but if you take it, you might have a breakthrough later, right? If you let it happen, you might have a breakthrough. And what Dante taught me was it is not okay for me not to challenge the space when it becomes unsafe for anybody in the class. And students teach me so much, and I've learned like it is okay to show up like yourself and pushing Dante to be like, you don't have to tell your story. And I, and I advise them, be careful who you tell your story to. And not everyone deserves it. So that's my story about, oh, by the way, it's called Danger of a Single Story, because if you haven't watched this already, one of the best TED Talks you'll ever watch is Shamanda Ngozi Adiche. She's the feminist on Beyonce's Flawless Song. Yeah. Watch her Danger of a Single Story. Everyone loves her. I, I'm, I'm a feminist um, TED Talk because of the Beyonce song, but the one before that that she did, Danger of a Single Story, is way more amazing, if you ask me. And what she talks about is how, for so many people, the one story about you becomes your whole narrative. Yes. And what I wanted to make sure from Dante was that he realized, is that story, whatever it was, I never learned what he did, about what he did in, an, uh, in another life, another past, is not his full story, and he gets to determine that. So that's the whole title of a single story. But I want to... Um, talk about psychological safety again and talk about some signs of, probably signs you don't know, of how BIPOC students and people and faculty don't feel safe. So self-doubt is a sign that the space might not be safe. So, self-doubt by people from underrepresented groups. So faculty members in the room, this happens to me so much, when students, students who are good students would constantly doubt themselves. 
you know, like you're in a classroom or you're in your office, and I told English, and I would hear a lot from students, you know, <clears throat> I know this isn't that good, but I, I can get better. And I'm like, this is great, right? They're like, nope, that is a sign that they are not psychologically safe, and they're probably bailing imposter syndrome too. An inability to realistically assess their competencies and skills. No matter how well they're doing, you ever have students from representing groups who just never walk into their confidence? They never are just like, I'm an amazing student. It's just always, yeah, I'm going to get better. Yeah, you know, I'm working on it. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm like, you're not just trying, you're doing. And I know because I did the same thing. Attributing their success to external factors, oh my goodness. Them saying, I just got lucky. I got an easy teacher this semester. I did this. Nope. Right? Like, all those things are signs that you are not safe in these spaces, berating their own performance, fear that they won't live up to expectations. My favorite one is overachieving. Most folks don't see overachieving as a sign that students are going through imposter syndrome and probably are unsafe, but it is. And I suffer from this throughout my entire academic career. And you might think, how is overachieving a sign? A lot of people from unrepresented groups don't feel like they can fail. Right, so I suffer from this anxiety of feeling like I could not do poorly in PWIs and still be seen as competent. Because when you're black in a PWI, you're suffering from stereotype threat. This idea that everything you do is reinforcing the stereotypes that are about you. So if I'm like, if I'm doing poorly in a class, I'm thinking to myself, and then you think that I don't belong here. So I have to constantly prove that I belong here, and I did that with my academic performance, right? And the minute I felt like I wasn't doing well, I'm like, you don't think, I'm, you don't think I belong here. Let me like work on it. And it was so exhausting, living like that. Never asking for help because I was scared that if I asked for help, you also thought that I didn't belong here, right? So not going to tutoring when I was struggling because I didn't want it to also be seen as, she doesn't, she doesn't belong here, she can't even do college math. Right? Like she's struggling in college, man, she doesn't belong here. So just all the ways I didn't do it and overachieving was something I felt like I had to do. Folks were just like, oh my God, you're in every honor society. It is because I was so afraid that the one minute I didn't do well, people were gonna see what I thought was my tell. And the tells are all my background. The tells are I'm from West Philly. I'm a first generation college student. I never had anybody in my family model what it's supposed to be like to be in this space. And they were gonna see that I didn't belong here. I was so addicted to this cover. Like, let me cover it up so that you don't find out the hypocrisy, the big secret, the big lie is that I don't belong in this space. And if you knew where I really came from, you would know that. So I was always really focused on being the best. And it was exhausting and no one saw it as exhausting. They praised me, they gave me accolades, they made me like the, you know, like the token all the time, but like they didn't realize was I was exhausted and I was so scared. I was so scared of not doing well on a test, of not passing a class, because then they would know, see, she don't belong here. She was, you know, she got here through affirmative action. Don't even get me started on that debate. But just like, that's a real thing, especially at PWIs. I would hear them talk about it. I would hear some students talk about how this person got in and how that person got in. And I'm just like, here we go. Right? Like, that's already the discourse that I'm going to feed into, like, I don't belong here. I didn't deserve that scholarship. Right? And I don't, you know, people like me don't belong in these spaces. So overachieving is something that we should really see sometimes as, pe like, as struggle. And then if we look at POC and BIPOC's masks come off, and this is for faculty and other staff in this room, part of the issue is that students need to learn how to take up more space. But the other issue is that we need to train faculty and staff to be able to absorb what they're about to get when they start taking their masks off. Because how you react when students from underrepresented groups show their hard truths will dictate if they do it again, right? If they do it once and when you receive it, you're defensive, you minimize, you invalidate, guess what? They're gonna do it again. No one wants to go through that again. I'm like, I'm good. Let me not do that ever again, because that was exhausting. You don't wanna do that a second time. So you have one chance, I'm gonna put like, pressure on you, but you got one chance to be empathetic listeners. You got one chance to not invalidate. You have one chance not to dismiss their experiences. By the way, those are not hard things to do. Empathetic listening, being compassionate should not be a hard skill. You got this, I promise, allies in the room, 
You got it. That's all you got to do. Thanks for sharing that. It's an easy go-to script to say when someone tells you a hard truth. Don't dismiss it. Don't challenge it. Don't play devil's advocate. That's not fun for us. I'm not trying to play when it comes to my racial identity and my lived experience. I'm tired. Being black is tiring. Just, just period, it's exhausting. I'm not trying to get in the base every minute of my day. So how do you make space for it? And here are some questions you should ask yourself, allies in the room. How are you going to facilitate these difficult dialogues? How are you preparing for people of color and black folks to tell their truths to you? In a, like, in a space where you're not shocked, where you're not dismissing it, where you're not putting the onus on them to help you understand, right? It, how much does your discomfort inform the way you teach black POC LGBTQ plus theme materials? This is a big one if you're an ally or a faculty member like in this room. I hear so many faculty tell me, I wanna teach these materials, but I just, I don't know which ones to choose. And I'm like, is that really the reason? Because we're academics, so we know how to find, you know what I mean? Like that's not what it is. But what it really is, is they're uncomfortable teaching this. And it's like, we're not gonna change the racial composition of our workforce overnight. So we're gonna to have to really put pressure on our allies to do better. So you're gonna be in these spaces with folks from underrepresented groups, and it's your responsibility, pedagogically, like curricularly, to be able to speak to their experience. So yup, you can teach Baldwin if you are an ally, but you're gonna to have to teach it in a way where you're able to address white privilege. And what we're really not saying is how many allies are addressing it in their lives outside of academia. So you gotta do that first. You gotta do that first because how are you teaching these sex without addressing white privilege? You cannot skate around this thing when you're teaching it. And you can't avoid it either. That's what's happening too. I'm gonna avoid it because I don't know how to address these things. You also have to make space for what kind of conversations these texts are going to facilitate in your classroom. I mean, if you're doing it well, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be some good debates happening. It's gonna be some hard truths happening in the class. And you have to say, how do I make space for that? One way I can say is to decenter yourselves. If you're an ally in this room, the first thing you need to do is, you might be uncomfortable when students are talking about their, like their hard truths after you teach a text that focuses on that. And that's okay, because guess what? It's not about you in that moment. Decenter yourself. You can be uncomfortable so that your students for an hour, an hour out of their day, get to share a hard truth without being invalidated, right? If you reframed it and made it about them and decentered it yourself, yes, white privilege is gonna make you uncomfortable talking about it, that's cool. You can be uncomfortable so they can feel safe, right? And leaning into that discomfort is something we have to really talk about. What is your relationship with these texts? Some people are like, I'm not teaching time to easy coats because I don't agree with it. Oh. Lord, okay. <laughs> but like, the reality is he's speaking to a lived experience that many black folks are living. So, right, like you need to be comfortable with this text. I mean, outside of class, during Christmas break, start a book club. I'm serious, start a book club, read these texts, lean into like that discomfort, practice what it means to, to like, Start a lecture and talk about privilege and systemic and structural racism. Practice it. And then if you want to, do it in front of an audience, a mock one, and get what the responses are gonna be, right? So you feel prepared and comfortable to have this conversation with your class because that is what it looks like to make space for folks from underrepresented groups. How do you create a space for BIPOC's authentic selves in a class? Do you fully contextualize POC theme pieces from a CRT perspective? That's critical race theory perspective. I study critical race theory, I publish in critical race theory. What I can tell you is, in critical race theory, we're going there. Eurocentrism, these are not bad words. Racism, you have to, you have to, become, you have to normalize these terms if you're gonna go there. And I have to tell you from working like in academia, I was in faculty meetings with just the mere, the mere me using the term racism made like turn folks off. I'm just like, how are y'all gonna get to where you're actually teaching this stuff if me saying it in a faculty meeting is making you uncomfortable? You know how many times I say it in my class? I swear African American literature. I'm like, I say it like 15 times a day, right? And we go in, I play a game. I, no, don't worry, it's not a harmful game. But in my African American lit course, I'm like the first games I, um, I play is I give them this critical race theory glossary. And I have to teach my students, even the most underrepresented groups that in this class, we gotta speak truth. So, 
These words aren't bad words. So the glossary is extensive, and it breaks down all the different types of racism. It's like, it has more than that in it, right? But it has all these different types of racism. I say, read it, we're gonna have a quiz the next day, but it's not a quiz, it's a game, but I gotta get them to read it, so I tell them they're gonna have a quiz. But that was a 52 fake out. Um, and the next class day, I would say to them, <clears throat> so what's your favorite type of racism from the glossary? And they'd be like, are you nuts? I'm like, I'll go first. Institutional racism like, is my favorite. It is my favorite out of all of them. And what I'm trying to get them to do is to normalize this rhetoric, right? Like, these are not bad words. I've studied this, we gotta go there. And I would write on the board why it's my favorite. I would name all the different institutions. And I was like, I love institutional racism because most folks think of morality when they think about racism, which drives me nuts. You know how many times I heard from, from people, I'm not racist, I'm a good person. Cool, newsflash, racism is systemic. <laughs> Right? If, it, if all it meant was that you were a bad person, I wouldn't be from a culture that had 400 years of oppression. <laughs> when you study oppression, it's not because people weren't good people. It was because they economically suppressed a whole group of people. Right? Every structure we have in this country was touched by racism, and that is what keeps communities oppressed. So also when folks come back at me and say, I'm not racist, I'm like, how'd you get away with that living in America? And I'm serious. How'd you get away with that? Because last time I checked, America is a racist construct. Our founding fathers were slave owners. They wrote a whole constitution that didn't include people like me as being free. So how did you get away with not being racist? I want to learn that. How did that happen? That's what I mean about educating yourself. Read in the intro to critical race theory during your Christmas break. Because it'll teach you a lot about the ways that you can't say you, you're not racist. Racist is not just a personal bias. It's a systemic structure that continues to oppress people from underrepresented groups. I, and, that, and I would name all different institutions. My favorite institution is religion. Sorry, Chestnut Hill. But I would write down on the board, how has religion been racist? And they would just be like, it's not. I'm like, <laughs> we're going to have fun today. <laughs> right? And then I would talk about how slave owners would hold church every Sunday for their slaves and how they used, they, they corrupted doctrines of religious texts to keep their slaves docile and obedient and scared. And I would just be like, right? And then I'm like, shh. And, that was, and they'd be like, that, that was crazy. I'm like, wasn't it? It was so crazy. I'm like, we're gonna read a whole lot of crazy stuff, this, right? And just that is the ways that it is structural. We need allies who are in classrooms to be able to teach our students that. And they exist. When I was in my PhD program, um, I took a black theater class by a white male who blew me away. He also got a lot of white students in my class mad all the time. And he didn't care. And I was here for it. He was so knowledgeable. He was so amazing. And he would do, it was the first time I was in a class where I was not the one that always had to be the one to educate everybody else. It felt refreshing. When I first, I was like, I don't know how to take this. I was in class and I was ready. And he was just like, by the way, John. And I was like, ooh, what's happening? What is happening? And he was using words like white supremacist structures. And I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. And they know what was happening. They were like, what, what are you doing? He was like, you know, just, you know, just teaching you something about critical race theory real quick. And let's go back to this. And it was amazing. And I kept thinking like, what if this was the model? if you had to learn this, right, and I wasn't the only one spewing this throughout classrooms. So just for the allies in the room, these are questions you really have to sit with. And in what ways do your teaching practices, my timer, um, replicate colonial hierarchies? Because that's the thing. I want to show a video. I don't know if you guys are, this is us fans, but I am, and I'm very upset that it went off. And one of my favorite scenes, just to give you some context, Randall's a black man who grew up in a white family. He's adopted, and he has two siblings, and they live in Pittsburgh. Okay, you guys know this, okay. And this episode is like right after George Floyd, and his sister Kate wants to talk to him about what's going on. She wants to like be there for him. I want you to watch how Kate, Kate is his sister, responds to Randall telling her a hard truth. And this is not a quiz, but we're gonna talk afterwards. I want you to think about has Kate made this space safe for him? It's not going to be as hard as you, as easy as you think to answer this, but let's go. Hey, Randall. So I was, uh, I was hoping 
you and Kev would talk, you know, clear the air. Hey. I'm not taking any sides. I know I live in L.A. with him, but I am totally Switzerland on this one. Okay. Randall, are we good? I mean, I've been texting and reaching out, and I haven't heard anything back, really, and I'm just so worried about about you and Beth and the girls, you know, with everything that's going on in the news. I'm so overwhelmed by it, I can't even imagine what you guys are all going through, so. I'm so sorry. Sorry about what? Specifically, what are you apologizing for? I'm just, I'm sorry about what's going on in the country and the protests and- Okay, the... but you've never apologized before. And this isn't the first black person to be killed on camera. No, it's, it's not. I don't know, this feels different. It's... Not for me, Kate. It's never been different for me. We grew up in the same house. Things like this have been happening to black people for years, and we've never talked about it. Like, not once. Not once in 40 years. I don't know what to say. I don't want to say... I don't want to say the wrong thing. Okay. So, growing up, I, uh, I just had to keep so many things to myself because I didn't want to make you guys feel bad. I didn't want you to have to worry about saying the wrong thing. Well, you're right. I mean, we never talked about it as kids. And I think mom and dad did the best they could, I guess, but... But I didn't get involved. I, I didn't even... See, I hate this, Kate. I hate seeing you upset. And normally I would hug you, and I would tell you that you did all the right things. I would try to make it all okay for you. But if I did that, Kate, if I made things better for you, then where does that leave me? I'm sorry, but I can't do that. That has been my pattern all my life. And honestly, Kate, it is exhausting. I'm exhausted. And all I want to do right now is go home and be with my wife and my girls. Okay. Okay. Um, I love you. And what is experience living in a predominantly white? It just blows my mind. You adopt a black child and think you never have to talk about it. And he spends his whole life loving people where he's protecting them when he's being harmed. Right? Okay, nail the key. The cake may say to me for our truth. What do you say? Did you handle that well? Do you feel like Randall felt like in the conversation? I can do this again with you. I can, I can share my hard truth. Why not? And even the first thing she said was, I'm supposed to live, I'm not taking your side, which is I'm not taking your side. Uh, right. Right? Like, not taking your side. Like, it's taking 
Wait. By the way, there are no socks. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, there's no socks. There's no socks. Exactly. Yeah, and everything she said was that then she just said it herself, like, I feel bad, but this is going on, and it wasn't about, wasn't making space for him in any way. Look, look, her thinking about herself. I think the actual words sometimes kind of actually hurt them saying it. I, I felt like she couldn't actually say mm -hmm. what she was saying she was sorry for. And that's almost what he wanted. Like, well, what are you sorry for? Because I wanted to hear it. Like, are you sorry because he was kid? Are you sorry? What, what are you, I wanted to hear it. I don't think she knew. And that's what I said earlier about the work that all I need to do is to educate yourself. I don't think she knew beyond the sorry. She doesn't know what to call it. That's problematic. You can't name it. It's not part of your lexicon. You don't have to know what that is. It's police brutality. It, right? Like, yes. name it. No, yes. like, like, that's what we saw. Yes. We saw a black man getting murdered yes. by a police officer. And I need you to say that it's wrong. I need you to say that that hurts you too. I need you to say that's not right. That there, like, there are no thoughts when it comes to that. Like, don't, right? Like, create the, like, the language to be compassionate and empathetic in this situation. It's not the time to be delicate. It's not the time to be like, I don't know what to say. I need you to try. I need you to look at that situation and be like, I need you to call it a thing and don't always rely on me to call it a thing. I need you to say racism. Like, I need you to say that that's what this is and that's what you're calling it. And he just told you a hard truth. And how do you make space for that hard truth? The crying, too, is an issue. I gotta say it. The crying was an issue. You might know why. I'm not saying that crying is not something you can do. But what did that do in that moment? Her crying. You in the back. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. No, it's fine. It made it all her. Right? She became the center. She became the center. But I said before, to de-center yourself. She became the center of that. And Randall said, I have to fight the earth to comfort you right now. Because you're my sister and you're hurting. And I want to comfort you right now. But for God's sake, I just watched the man get murdered on TV. And I look like that man, and I can't comfort you right now. And who needs to comfort you in this dynamic? Right? Randall does. Why isn't she grabbing him and giving him a hug? Right? And being like, I am so sorry what's happening to you. It's not time for me to unpack all my feelings. I just look at my own time. Create another space. I find a space where I can unpack that. But right now, what is he need? And just so much about your centers in this country, sorry, um, in this country shows us that we are never at the center. Like, my pain has to come before your guilt right now. Like, at what point do we say, I'm more important than your guilt right now? I need you to put that to the side because I'm, pain, like, I'm in pain, I'm suffering, I'm a father. Randall's a father, not me. Randall's a father, and he's like, I got to worry about a lot, of, a lot of things right now, and the last thing I want to do is sit here and talk with y'all about how you need to make space for me. And that is what it means to make space for someone, to de-center yourself enough where it's like, I'm not, I'm not at the center of this. My guilt isn't, my ancestral legacy isn't. It's not the time for you to, to like defend it or go into a whole self-deprecating, nope, no, not that at all, because it's not about you. It's about these people. So I know we're running out of time, but I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a zip through some things for the people who are not allowed in this room for a minute and how you protect yourself and things you should do, because that's really important. I'm going to zip through what I promise. What does it mean to be normal, normalized, unapologetic authenticity? So in these pictures are all people of color, mostly black people, who have lived their lives unapologetically authentic that I am a fan of. Some of them are dead because they're old, but some of them are alive and you should follow them. The one before that was Brittany Cooper, the author of Eloquent Rage, a black study professor at Rutgers University, freaking amazing, also a really big voice in the political discourse and all the things. She's amazing, follow her. Um, this is Angela Rye. A uh, lawyer, uh, former chief of the NWACP, who's on CNN every, all the time, being her unapologetic black woman self, cursing out the folks, all the things, naming it. You gotta watch her. She's good TV and she's also brilliant. But it means creating spaces where students don't feel like they have to shrink. Oh, you gotta see her. She does more than that. She does more than that. She gets out of, oh my goodness. Her and Simone, but, uh, wait, wait, what is it? Uh, Biden's new, is it press secretary? Oh, what is Simone's last name? Simone Sanders, love her too. You gotta follow her, black woman. She doesn't play, she does not care. She eats them up on CNN, on MSNBC, eats them up. It means to resist the urge to shrink.
By the way, that's Getting Grown podcast, amazing podcast. You should watch it. Two black women who are living their authentic lives. Elaine Walteroff, the author of, um, I forgot the whole name of it, but she is the first black, she was the first black editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue. Her book is all about what those three years were like, telling the truth about how those folks wanted every, every minute for her to shrink how she didn't. And then she quit after three years because she was like, I'm not taking this anymore. But she's also like on Project Runway and all the things. James Baldwin, he is passed, but he's amazing. Read his stuff. Um, quieting like the negative self-talk. Negative self-talk is this psychological phenomenon where people of color um, believe all of the negative talk about, that's like about them. So for instance, people say we have to shrink to belong in spaces. We believe we got to do that to be successful. Right, that's negative self-talk. If you reversed it and was like, nope, I'm coming in here, all this space, and this space gotta, gotta make room for me. I want the students in here who are from underrepresented groups to stop shrinking and think for a minute, what would happen if you didn't? The space would just have to get bigger. It would just have to, right, just spread out in it and be like, you got it, you got it, and they are gonna be okay too. Everybody who's in that room is gonna be okay. Um, but read Baldwin stuff, cause he's amazing. Oh my goodness, this isn't working for me. Toni Morrison, are you freaking kidding me? I mean, come on now. But her interviews, my favorite interview, watch Toni Morrison YouTube video, put Toni Morrison and Charlie Rose in and how she eats him up on his own show for, no, oh, she does. And it is beautiful and it is eloquent and it is stunning. And she's like, don't play with me. Don't bring me on this show and be on this foolishness. And she defends, because he asks her why in every book she has, all her characters are black. And then she feels like she's isolating her audience by having all black characters. And it is the best 15 minutes you will ever watch in your life on how she reads this man. And I'm just like, ooh, Toni Morrison. Like, just, and then she asks him questions. She turns it on him. And I'm, I'm not joking, on his own show. It is amazing. Put it in YouTube. You will love it. And then brave dreaming. Brave dreaming is a phenomenon that I think people of color need to do. And, with, and what that really means is you are not apologizing for your dreams either. I grew up in a, like in a background where people saw me, I told them my story, and they immediately tried to tell me what I couldn't do because of my story. When I was in grad school, I wanted to get a PhD, and I had a 3.87 GPA in my grad program. And the fact remember that I first asked right, my recommendation told me that I wouldn't make it because the school I was choosing was rural and I was a city girl. Mind you, I had never talked to her ever about anything except for the fact that I was from West Philly. By the way, I went to that school, graduated at 4.0, and, and my dissertation won the Dissertation of the Year Award. But she didn't write my recommendation. But guess what else she did? When I had that meeting with her, I guess my department chair tipped her off, and she came in with a file this big of all the reasons why I shouldn't get the PhD. One of them was that she read an article that black PhDs weren't getting jobs. Don't let me tell you my story about how, like, I literally had three job offers before I chose the one that I'm in right now, before I transitioned. And I'm in an industry that I have no experience in. I mean, they pay me top dollar and you know, like the whole thing. But let her tell it, I wasn't going to make it in this 10 years ago because black PhDs weren't getting jobs. But that's what she spent her time on. Not affirming me, but telling me that I wasn't going to make it in this, which was, and I thought we were good friends. It means creating brave spaces as well as safe spaces. It means telling the truth even when it's a hard truth. People from underrepresented groups, I'm talking to you for a minute. Tell your hard truths. It's like a muscle. Start doing it over and over again and unrelinquish yourself from the burden of having to comfort the person that you tell the hard truth to. Do it and leave. Like, no, I'm serious. I can teach you. I do it. I had got this down to with science. I tell them, like, you know, have a good day. I'll see you later. Like, I, I like do it that way. You know, you did this and I hope you like don't do it again. I'm going to go to lunch. Have a great day. And, she, and I don't even give you time to, nope, you, you are not unpacking on me. And I'm leaving. See you later. Have a great day. And I'll see you tomorrow in like the next meeting. And that's how I deal with it. I, I literally, Tiny Heasy Coastal, my favorites too. Recognize that many of your students suffer from a paralyzing brand of imposter syndrome. Issa Rae, oh, oh my goodness. Oh, I know. I try to everybody like in every industry. It means making sure that we are intrusive in our mentorship, allies in this room and faculty. Intrusive membership is a concept that I want you to learn because it also means that you might have to be intrusive when it comes to BIPOC and POCs futures. Right? I mean, you want to have to speak into them that, like they belong here. My mentor, my first one, and I love her, she volunteered me. She applied for things without me, without, like my permission. And then she sent me the application over an email after it was filled out. And was like, by the way, I applied for this for you. Let me know how it goes. 
over and over and over again. She was an Asian American woman. And she was like, I'm not letting you make these decisions. You, here we go. You suffer from imposter syndrome. You're not going to do it. So I'm going to fill it out for you. And I got so many opportunities because of it. That's intrusive mentorship, right? She recognized that I wasn't going to do it because I suffer from imposter syndrome and let me do it for you because you're not missing out on these opportunities. And what it did was give me confidence. The more she did it and the more I got it, I was like, hold on. I'm competitive a little bit. I'm competing and getting it. She's like, I told you, right? And that's what intrusive mentorship looks like. Ooh, Yaba Blay, Love Ya Jai, Jamel Hill, they all got podcasts, by the way. And um, Amanda Sills, all unapologetically themselves in all the spaces they're in. Um, multiple truths at the same time. So two things can be true at the same time, right? And we dismiss that, right? You cannot be racist and also microaggress me in the same moment. That can be true at the same time. Both of those things are true. You might not be racist, but you did microaggress me. And you should take accountability for that in that moment. Those two things can be true at the same time. So um, Yada Blake calls it the pluriverse. Can we enter the pluriverse for a minute and understand that all these things can be true at the same time and you need to open up space for those complexities? You already know who this girl is. I'm not going to talk. I know, I know, I know. I can't. I'm anxious. Okay. But let's, I know who I hope she is. <laughs> but it means letting our students live experiences and realities inform every aspect of our teaching. And then these are for the teachers in the room. I will send Sister um, Kathy this. But this is my playlist for teachers, right? Faculty are always asking me, what can I do? I hate giving formulas, but I want you to read this at, like, in your own time. But select materials and applications to those people from marginalized groups. All these things you should do. It's not like... It's not a formula, but it is very close to it. I will send, I, Sister Cassie, this is a start, right? It is, it is a start and it's great. Um, for the institution itself, what I hope to happen, higher ed as an institution, this is, my, this is my wish list. That BIPOC students have professors who are knowledgeable on topics that speak to their communities. It's not just happening in black studies classes, but in their sociology class, in their psychology class, in all of the classes, they have professors who have studied CRT, gender studies, post-colonialism for God's sakes, and that they are knowledgeable enough and they're the experts on this so that their students are getting this knowledge as well. They have professors who are culturally competent enough to facilitate productive, rigorous racial dialogues, because this, like, this should be part of your job now, because our student population is changing. They have assignments that hold space for their lived experiences and realities. They are provided feedback that deepen their understanding of CRT concepts and frameworks. This is also what it means as a teacher and as an ally to be able to be this for your students. BIPOC students are directed to resources and opportunities that will help jumpstart their careers. By the way, the one before that is also because how tired I was as a faculty member that every student from every discipline was coming to me to ask me about what they should get their graduate degree in and showing me this paper from their social class that the professor didn't really understand and what can, I'm like, Lord, this is, this is exhausting. Can we get more faculty? I'm serious, like, right? Like, I need you to be able to do this too. BIPOC students are directed to resources and opportunities that will help jumpstart their careers. Start researching if you're an ally of minority professional organizations. They do scholarships, they do internships. This is what your students from underrepresented groups need. What are those opportunities for them and how can you guide them into them? They're easily accessible in this digital age and you should become really knowledgeable on this because your students want to do really amazing things in their careers and they deserve professors who are able to say, you know what you should look at? You know, you should look at NAVA, which is the National Association for Black Accountants, right? Because they do this scholarship every year and they have this fellowship. Or if you have a, faculty, a student who's into sports psychology, they should know that the NBA is doing a new fellowship just for black students. Do your research so that you can be resources for them. Again, not all, all the faculty from color, of color. And then they are encouraged to explore historical patterns of inequity instead of pushing them to neutralize their perspective. This also is happening all over academia and it's driving me nuts. It should drive you guys nuts too. They should not be pushed to not focus on structural racism gender inequality because you're uncomfortable. This is, not the, this is not the space for you to gear them because this, like, this is too aggressive. This is their lived experience, it's valuable, it's important, and they should be able to explore it. And by the way, there are so many jobs they can do if they do. Look at me. I'm not joking. I got a degree in critical race theory and now I'm being paid in an industry I have no experience in. I don't even like sports. 
And I work in the sports and entertainment industry every day, advising and consulting pro sports teams on how they can make their workspaces more inclusive where people will come. Look at God. Look at what happened. But if I would have been guided by the faculty members, they would have told me that I was narrowing my job um, um, prospects. Not true at all. I'm in demand, actually, because this is something that folks don't have expertise in. So this is, these are my wish list, and I'm done. Um, and I'll take any questions, but um, yeah, I hope you guys found this valuable, and I also hope that you, um, yeah, do some of this stuff, because, you know, like, it's exhausting being folks from underrepresented groups, and I really, truly believe, as a first-generation student, as a black woman, that, you know, Folks from underrepresented groups deserve to brave dream out loud, right? They deserve for folks to affirm them and believe in them and talk confidence into them and, and, like, and for them to be able to be all of who they are in these classrooms. So thank you so much for this presentation. <laughs> and I'll take any questions or comments. You want to uh, do I go or you go, sure. Sister Kathy? Okay. She's coming. Um, hi. Hi. Um, should I stand? Or? Whatever you want. Whatever um, you're comfortable with. So um, I've been in um, predominantly white schools and specifically Catholic schools since first grade. Mm -hmm. And my whole family's from West Philly too, so yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've had one black teacher wow. my entire time. I had an assistant black teacher in preschool, but that doesn't really, I don't remember that. So um, my question basically is how do you, how am I supposed to deal with like the classroom setting of like not being respected or like not being heard, especially like when you take it to higher people and they're just not listening. And it's like you're, you're just frustrated. What's your name again? Darian. Darian, you're getting me so mad right now. No, 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 not at you. I know, at I know, I know. No, I mean, <laughs> this is honestly part of the reasons why I left academia because I was so frustrated with the experience you just said. The fact that when you take it to the people, no one's addressing it. And it's, I don't have a, like a straightforward answer for you, except I am really hoping that this experience changes for later generations. But it only will if the people in this room who, who are in positions of power hear what, right? Like what I just presented and, you know, cause that's where it comes from. There are so many pockets of concentrated power in these structures and higher ed education is a structure. And it takes so much to make those changes and you can't make it. My answer to you is it's not on you, right? The institution needs to change, not you. You keep doing what you're doing because you, you aren't supposed to have to change this, right? I will say, you know, I want to say to you, keep speaking your truth, keep challenging it. But the reality is you are not in a position yet where you can make those calculations and that they're always going to go your way. Right, so what I will say is what I said to a few of the students who were at dinner with me beforehand, was that create your own safe space where you have an outlet to unapologetically and unfiltered, you know, talk about your frustrations about it. Right, like I have a, I have a core group of friends from college. We've been friends forever. I'm a corporate VP. My best friend is a city council person. My other best friend is a district attorney for the city. And we go in on our group threads. We do girls trips. We, like, we create space where we can just talk truth about what's really going on. And then let's hope that these institutions change so these are not your experiences moving forward. Other questions? Oh. Hey, how's it going? Um, my name is Matt. I'm, I'm a special ed um, teacher. And um, mm -hmm. you talk about, um, by the way, it was a great, great presentation. I Thank really love it. You. Um, you talk about like putting like your identity on hold. Like you were trying to fit into mm -hmm. the, the mold to get to where um, you thought like you wanted to be. Mm -hmm. 
All right, and, and just like with that, you said like not in position to do that. Do you suggest that um, you try to get to that point? Because like you said, like to get to that point, do you have to fit in first, then get to that point where you're, now you're making change because you are at the top of that position? That's such a good question. And my answer is complicated, okay. meaning, Again, back to what I said earlier with Darian, I want to tell you, be authentic from the beginning. Because so many things I had to unlearn. But the reality is, I don't know, again, back to the structures. It's not on us. I, I hate that we have to make these decisions, right? We as POC folk have to make these decisions. We're really like the space should change so that we don't feel like, you know, we have to make these kind of concessions, these cultural concessions. That's what we're doing all the time, right? You're making calculations, like is this space safe enough? And then we test it a little bit, however you test it. I had a friend who told me that he, you know, brought some food from his ethnic background into the office one day and was like, well, anybody say anything, right? We're doing these small tests to see, can they take it? Can they take me in this space? I mean, the reality of it is, it's like, what you're asking is, do you play the game? Yeah. And I'm a huge proponent of changing the game. I, uh, some people are like, I play the game well and they're proud of it. And I'm like, I'm not trying to play it anymore. I'm exhausted from playing the game. I'm changing the game so that it does not, the rules are not that I am constantly shrinking myself to be successful. So I would say test the space out, right? And I hate that I'm saying this, but that's what you do. This, the me you're seeing now came after years. If I'm being honest, I took, I was in therapy. Like this, navigating these spaces was causing me, and you know, I didn't grow up in a family where we even, believed in therapy. So I didn't know what I was going through was anxiety, but I knew that something was really wrong. And then I was feeling really tired all the time and I felt like I was just like this tight ball all the time. So I went to therapy and I have an amazing therapist who was like, you suffer from anxiety, but it's definitely racism related anxiety. You have learned to navigate these spaces in a way that you, I, you can't, I, this won't sustain itself. So just, and what she taught me was, do it little by little. Like what's one thing you can do in that space to make yourself feel like more authentic. Do that first, and it was little things. My syllabus was the first thing I did, right? And then no one died, I'm, right? I, Cause like, that's our worst fear. Like I'm gonna do it and everybody gonna be like, oh my God, you're horrible. I was like, okay, I'm still here. I did that and that happened. You're gonna go on education, like those things, right? Yeah. Speak up in a meeting and be like, you know what? I wanna create this and whatever that is, right? An employee resource group, but whatever. That's what I started doing. And little by little, I'm just like, okay, no one died, right? I did this. I started cold switching little by little in, in my classroom, and then something positive happened. Students were like, I love you. I'm taking you again. And I became more popular because I was being more authentic. So I would say try, like test it out. And honestly, if you test it out in whatever space you're in, when you're in like special ed, you feel like you can't do it, that's not the space for you. That's what I wish someone would have told me. Stop trying to fit into these spaces and start identifying this space is not for me. I am no longer trying to fit into a space. If I go into a space and I'm just like, I can't code switch without being policed, guess what? I, I don't belong there. Let me look for another job. I'll be fine, because this space is not for me. Same thing with classrooms and schools. Let me look for another professor, because sociology has more, you know what I mean? Let me leave this class, because it's not for me, right? Like, if we did it that way, like, it's not that I'm supposed to fit into this space. This space don't fit me. That's how I start thinking about things. This is not a space that is for and designed for somebody like me. So let me leave, because y'all don't want me. Y'all don't want me, now I don't want you. This is a mutual uncoupling, right? <laughs> and I'm gonna find like, better pastures where this space is for me. And when you find your space, it's beautiful. Because you're being you, you're being authentic, and you're like, yep, I'm doing this, and I'm happy. Not just in work, but outside of work. I'm not going home in these balls no more. Figuring out why I had high blood pressure at 35. Right? I'm like, mm-mm, that's not it. I'm not doing this anymore. So that's my suggestion. Test it out. And if you test it out too many times and you don't feel like it, you're in special ed, you will be a commodity. You can jump from whatever school to whatever school you want to. And it's a teacher shortage right now. You are definitely in demand. So just, you know, start yeah. looking. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. He, she wants to go. Hi, my name is Diamond. Um, I'm currently speaking with, I'm working with preschool and I'm a teacher in preschool. But I think it's like the total opposite. I'm like, probably the 
only teacher that has the highest, highest education in that, in that school. Nice. So I'm normally picked on by the black people. Like, oh, you, you know, you act white or you, oh, Lord. you know, so it's like the total opposite. I feel mm -hmm. uncomfortable where I'm at because it's like, oh, oh, we don't need that education or to be here and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it, I feel like other black people can make you feel uncomfortable about being educated or hiring yourself as well. So, you know, that's what I'm dealing with now. Absolutely. So. Like, that's called authenticity politics, by the way. And it's something that happens within communities all the time. And part of it is that we reduce blackness to one monolithic perspective, right? So the whole acting white thing drives me nuts because that also means that we are equating intellectualism with whiteness. Okay. Okay. So I often have to explain to them, I'm educated. How am I acting white? That's what, I know, but also, since yeah. when are we giving, so whiteness, whiteness gets to close the market on intellectualism, we're saying too. Right, that to be black doesn't mean you can be educated. Mm -hmm. And what I will tell you is follow some people like that I went through because they will definitely change their mind on it and they authentic and they code switching all day long. You know, I'm serious. Like, follow some of them people and it will change your perspective. You can't change them, but you can change how you show up in those spaces. Yeah. Right? Like, don't try to change them because that's not, they're not worth it. But change how you show up and react to it. Yeah. And start listening to some podcasts. Getting grown will help you. Okay. Right? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. Right? And like, um, more like the host like, has a PhD. And she is, in her own words, Sophista Ratchet. And I'm here for all of it, all day long. All day long. That is my bag. I go for all of the Sophista Ratchet intellectuals. That's what I call them. Like the Mark Lamont Hills, the Brittany Coopers, the Angela Ross. I'm like, we are the same kind of people. I like it. We smart, we educated, and we Sophista Ratchet all in one. Again, most pluriverse. <laughs> right? All these things can be true at the same time. And I love it, and we can be unapologetic about it. So. Yeah, just how you show up in the space, that's fine. Because they're limited. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame, but it happens. Yeah. Do we have time for any more? Okay. Thank you. So my question to you is, what kind of guidance or advice would you provide someone who suffers? Because I, I feel like it's a sufferer. Yeah. Um, suffers from that overachieving, that type A, mm. and has reached the exhaustion where it's now self-sabotaging. What advice would you give that person? I'm going to get real therapeutic for a minute. So just, just what my therapist taught me and told me about it. And she said, what if you didn't? She says, what's your worst fear? Right? She says, so if you didn't get the good grades, if you didn't accomplish all the accomplishments, is your worst fear that the people in your life like, won't love you? Right? She's like, is that what you're saying? That like, the love that you get from your family and your friends is contingent upon you doing well? And then she was like, how much of your self-identity and self-worth is wrapped into your work product and your labor? Because that, that should only be one part of us. And the fact that it was all of who I thought I was was the problem. I'm so much more than that. And right, so that's what I had to also like, realize. Give myself permission to, like, to not have my whole identity wrapped up into my achievements. Because those are great, but I'm, I'm more than that, right? And like talking it into myself and doing that self work, that's like that self development work that is hard and it's, and it's a long road to be like, is all my identity and self worth wrapped into my achievements? Usually for overachievers, your answer is yes. I had to answer her yes, like, damn, you're right. I do think my world going to end. I do think that everybody's not going to love me if I'm not. Like, who am I to my family? I had to ask myself, who am I to my family if I'm not an overachiever? My mom loves to brag about me because, you know, I'm first gen and all the things. She worked really hard to sacrifice to get me where I am. And, I, and so much of my overachievement was about that. I wanted, I wanted to make sure she can continue to brag about me. But my therapist was like, your life, like this is your life, right? So she should be proud of you no matter what. And like everybody I'm thinking, right? Like if you just start thinking that, like your self-worth and identity. And for black women, I feel like we carry this a lot. I detach myself detach my identity from how much I can endure struggle, how much I can get accomplished in the most chaotic of environments, how much of my labor, how much of my identity is based on my labor and what I can produce. Don't get me started about how they can track me, trace all the way back to slavery times, but whatever, like it can be, and part of it is just like, I am more than my labor, I am more than my accomplishments, I deserve rest. Like, don't even get me started, like I have changed my entire life after doing therapy and realizing that like, that's where all this comes from. I'm fine. I take vacations and I don't bring like, 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 I'm, like, I'm, I'm like my laptop at all. 
on purpose. I'm not answering not one email on vacation. I'm good because my whole life is not attached and self-worth attached to me being on go every minute for you. And what I was most scared of, even in a work capacity, was like, will I still be seen as competent if I don't answer the one email? If, I, if I'm not, if I don't solve every problem. And I had to look around where I worked and was like, who else is able to do that? They still are, they are still seen as competent. They're not solving every problem. They are not, not taking vacations. They are able to say in meetings, I don't know. Let me get back to you. So just like lean into the fear. And what's the fear? And then being like, will I be okay if I don't get this A on this, on this test? Am I okay if I'm not? You know what I mean? Like, that's what I had to ask myself. Like, what is driving my overachievement? And it was acceptance and validation. I got a lot of validation from my overachievement. And just like, what was I afraid of? Was I afraid that if people didn't praise my accolades, then I wouldn't be worth their time, their patience, their love? Yup, I was scared of all of that. And that's BS. I don't want cursing here. That's, that's <laughs> what I was leaning towards, that it, when, when you assimilate for so long, um, that it's hard to break that cycle. It is. And I mean, this took years for me, and I'm still working on it. I'm still telling myself all the time, show up in these spaces authentically debonair. Challenge these folks, even if they get upset. I challenged my CEO yesterday, because he went up on stage during a town hall, and I gave him talking points about diversity and inclusion, and he didn't use them, and all hell broke loose in the town hall with the people that were in the audience, because they felt like he wasn't being... Like that, I'm like, that he wasn't really explaining what we're doing in DEI. And then afterwards, I'm like, you have to check your privilege. You're not saying it because you're so scared of admitting that you, you do have this. You flew in on a private jet to this. Like, <laughs> and you're flying out on one, right? And you never see these people. Like, our frontline workers who are predominantly black in our venues, right? Our concession stand workers, our custodians, our servers. They're the ones that were in the audience, and they need to hear that you understand that you are privileged and that we, in our DEI journey, are going to address that. And he didn't, and I'm just like, you, right? That's how I showed up there. You know, I, I could have, like, lost my job. I don't know. Probably not, because no one else can do, like, what I do with this job. And that's, I mean, I work in a very, very not diverse space. So, but, you know, I, I showed up, like, and I said, you got to stop doing this. And do we need some more executive coaching? Like a child, I'm asking this. Do we need this? Yes. Do you need more of this before like, you like, like do anymore? Do we need to have some more lessons on privilege? <laughs> like, right, like before you talk again? So just, it's like a muscle. I practice it, and I know that at the end of the day, I'm doing the right thing for me, right? And just, if I center me in this, this is what I need to do. So, hope that answers your question. I think we're running out of time, so thank you all again, and have a great evening. <laughs>